Hello, my name is Matthew Pratt, and welcome to my presentation for Bird Electrons 2021. Uh, my topic today is an unexpected journey towards creative programming. So firstly, who am I? Um, again, my name is Matthew Pratt. I'm a classically trained composer, um, and I studied piano at the University of Cape Town with Professor Hendrik Hofmeyer and Theo Herbst, who are both my co-supervisors for my uh, master's at the same university. I'm also a creative programmer, integrating SuperCollide and processing into my composition process. My composition process and my creative interests as a whole center around my idea of texture uh, or my interpretation of it. And for me, what makes up texture is a variety of things, um, some of which include the visual slash oral color and imagery of a piece of, of music or of art or sound art, um, as well as the various musical elements, so melody, uh, harmony, rhythm, uh, timbre, etc. Sensation, tactile sensation, uh, experience, immersion, spatiality, all of these sort of contribute towards what my idea of texture is. And the way I go about this, or the way I go about creating music, my process is through traditional acoustic and electroacoustic um, composition practices, but also through creative programming. Um, and for me, the whole process, as well as the structure and the end product are of equal importance. In other words, where you begin, what you're doing in the middle and what you have at the end all contribute towards the to the work and are all important. And my compositions usually start from a concept or a theme and work from there. I find it's a lot easier as a creative to work when you have a concept in mind. It just makes life easier for me. Um, and that's the way I work. My early musical influences are quite varied. Um, early, um, earliest memories include uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi's recordings of Mozart, uh, Mozart Piano Concerto Number no. 20, um, some of his sonatas, as well as some um, Chopin Etudes and Nocturnes, uh, Rachmaninoff Piano Concerti, both of, well, numbers two and three, as well as some preludes, etc. So these are a uh, sort of early classical influences when I was very, very young. Um, uh, later on, or sort of at the same time, uh, I had some influences from, oh, I enjoyed listening to um, Ismail Lo and Cesaria Vora. Um, Ismail is a Senegalese musician, very interesting, um, musically, as well as Cesaria Vora. Um, again, music, musically, quite interesting stuff, quite um, different stuff from Mozart Chopin, Mozart Chopin and Rachmaninoff. More influences include Oscar Peterson, the jazz pianist, a Canadian jazz pianist, who you can see there on the right. Incredibly gifted pianist, um, musician, composer, great, great influencer for me. Um, jazz, we're talking, which is not strange. I mean, I, there was a large period of my life, and I can still say that I do listen to jazz, but very, very... <laughs> very infrequently in the past I would listen to Oscar Peterson um, and his trio quite quite regularly. Other jazz pianists uh, include Jacques Lussier um, who did a record on uh, sort of reinterpreting Bach which I found really cool sort of jazzy Bach uh, and David Benoit who is an American pianist. A big influence later on, um, my teenage years, early teenage years, um, in fact, yeah, from about 11, 11 years up, 11, 12, I do remember listening to a lot of Coldplay, the British band, if, you weren't, if you're not familiar with them. The most influential album for me was X and Y, which was 2009, I think it was, so long, long time ago. Um, to be honest, I haven't listened to any of their records since um, Viva La Vida. Besides X and Y, another um, 
record that influenced me or that I enjoyed listening to was A Rush of Blood to the Head, which was their second studio album. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with songs such as The Scientist and Clocks, um, both of them, and Amsterdam, um, the third third um, piece listed there, are all very piano-driven. Obviously, as a young pianist, I found that very stimulating. Um, going to my piano teacher at the time saying, I want to learn Coldplay songs, I want to learn Coldplay songs, I don't just want to do Bach and Mozart and, and you know, um, ABRSM pieces. Um, me kind of wanting to wanting to enjoy, enjoy um, some more current stuff or some more stuff from that time. But I think the most influential one for me was was X and Y. It's kind of very ambient music. Um, so the introduction of kind of synths and lots of reverb and just the kind of spacey space space alt rock. Um, that that Coldplay were known for during that time. Um, I can't name any recent songs to be quite honest, um, but X and Y was was a um, was one of my one of my favorite records um, ever. Some uh, songs and they include Square One, Speed of Sound, Fix You, which is the very famous um, piece song that begins with Chris Martin and an organ. Um, Everybody knows that one. And then talk, slightly less known. Um, that also a, a, a good piece. Then a massive, massive, massive influence besides Coldplay was, or still is for that matter, um, the British band Muse. Um, Matt Bellamy is the person you see there playing guitar. Um, he's the front man, the singer, lead guitarist and pianist. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal pianist and really um, inspired me in many ways um, as a young pianist of sort of mainly piano um, classical music with some Coldplay and some um, kind of fa fairly easy stuff um, or fairly straightforward stuff um, to see him perform. Um, I didn't see him live, but to, to listen to his music um, and I actually bought one of his records live at Wembley watched that so many times. <laughs> it's a great record. Um, really, really, really good piece. Um, so he's known for, well, Muse as a band that if you ask anyone who about Muse, if they know who Muse is, the first song that they'll tell you about, I suppose, is Supermassive Black Hole, which is um, an epic piece. Yeah, that's all I can say. Look it up if you don't know it. <laughs> um, but just to go back, Feeling Good, the Nina Simone song, or I don't think she composed it, but it was popularized by her. Um, he performed that on the record Origin of Symmetry, which was their second record. Then the piece that really got me as a pianist um, was Butterflies and Hurricanes. Their sort of cadenza in the middle, the interlude, inspired incredibly by Rachmaninoff. The song Hysteria, also from the record Absolution. Um, this was actually the first piece that I ever wanted to play on bass guitar. Um, I played bass guitar. I was in a band um, where I was a singer, bass guitarist, and um, pianist or keyboardist. Hysteria was one of those pieces that I listened to, and I thought I need to learn that bass line. Um, Chris, the bassist from Muse, is a fantastic, fantastic musician. Great, um, great song. And then uh, another example is Map of the Problematic, which is on the same record as Supermassive Black Hole, uh, which is Black Holes and Revelations. Um, so I was, like I said, um, a singer, keyboardist, and bass player for the band called Shout Hey. Um, there were three of us initially. We had a fourth join us on the second tour that we did, which was this New Horizons tour. Uh, you see the poster there on the right. Um, yeah, so I was a, a pretty much, well, I was one of the two primary uh, singer, um, singer slash co uh, songwriters for that matter. Um, the two of us, myself and, and Tim, a very good friend of mine, we, the both of us, were um, the singers, the front men, so to speak. And we wrote the music mostly. 
So this was kind of my beginnings as a sort of proper composer, so to speak, um, writing essentially sort of indie pop slash alternative music um, for Chate. I'm not going to play any examples because <laughs> it was a different time in my life. It's It was an influential part of my life, getting my music performed, recorded. We did two tours of South Africa. You know, the first round through we were 18, the second time through we were 19. So <laughs> really, really young sort of indie pop alternative musicians driving around the country um, in a Toyota Oris with a trailer, a Fenta trailer. <laughs> a red Toyota Oris, who I think Tim's, uh, Tim still drives. He calls her Ruby. Uh, so during this time, I also obviously spent time in studio. We worked with a, an engineer slash producer called Dave Grevler, um, who was also a musician at the time. Uh, and we recorded all but two, I think, songs there. Um, and... Yeah, it was a great experience. At the time, I was also um, interested in, I still am again, all these things add up um, and are all linked to how who I am as a musician um, slash composer slash engineer, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was fascinated in recording. I read the Pro Tools reference guide <laughs> cover to cover. I think I was 16 or something. Um, I wanted so much to have my own studio um and all of that just make music and record and mix and do stuff so that was very much me at the time really wanting to make music and making music and performing it um but very very different um to what i'm doing these days and to what i what i did afterwards a big influence of mine early on um if you throw in there with alternative rock and jazz and whatnot. Um, the main sort of influence for me from a classical perspective was, still is for that matter, um, 20th century French music um, or 20th century music and as well as early 20th French music from the early 20th century and onwards. If I think back to my earliest memories of composition, mm, I think the first piece that I really remember was a piece for piano, solo piano. It was about 11 at the time. Um, I think I performed it at one of our concerts as well, one of my teacher's little end of year concerts. It was in D Aeolian, if I'm not mistaken. Um, very simple piece, about two minutes long, sort of quasi improvisatory. I was very young at the time. I didn't even write it down. I didn't know how to, frankly. Um, but that was kind of my the first, my first memory of a, a composition that I wrote, um, and it um, was influenced by by Impressionist music at the time, including the music of Debussy, Ravel, and Satie. And what interested me the most, uh, whether it was consciously or subconsciously, I think these days I can I can identify it, um, was the harmony and the color, again texture, so to speak, um, and obviously the French language. <laughs> I am a Francophile. Um, I speak French. I love all things French. Um, then if we move on to my studies at university, um, I took music theory and analysis uh, right up to fourth year. Having that fundamental knowledge really helps as a composer to understand others' works as well as your own and how to leverage theoretical ideas and um, procedures to make to make music in a way that hopefully sounds good and we saw i saw in in music theory and analysis um, a gradual development from the harmony of bach straight through to the french composers um early atonality serialism um moving on to my studies in orchestration and composition um here i took what we learned in theory and analysis um, and applied it um, as a kind of foundation. And my studies at the University of Cape Town in orchestration and composition really initiated my um, creative palette, so to speak. What, what I have at my disposal as a composer, um, what I understand, what I like, what I don't like, basically studying composers' works and 
the composers themselves um, and basically how they go about doing it is doing what it is they do. And in orchestration and composition, we um, moved on from sort of Baroque and classical um, harmony onwards to the um, late Romantic, um, early 20th century, as well as atonal uh, music and, and further as well in composition three. We learned about modalism, serialism, and atonality towards the end. And now, finally, after my studies at the university, I, I my undergraduate studies, I finally found felt like a composer. And towards the end of my studies, as well as, in fact, during during fourth year and and even earlier, I was fascinated and still am fascinated by Olivier Messiaen, the French composer, and his treatise called La Technique de mon langage musical. In it, he discusses how he composes, what in, what um, influences him, what he strives to achieve, how he goes about it. And things that stuck out, I suppose the two things that stuck out mostly for me were his modes of limited transposition, which govern what notes you use to write melodies and harmonies. Um, it goes a bit deeper than just that, but fundamentally that's what it does. It helps you establish a mode um, from which you can choose notes and in, a, in many ways it's like it's like serialism but i find a bit more flexible um, as well as his ideas of rhythm um, he goes into detail on his ideas of non-retrogradable rhythm his influences from indian classical music um, his influence or his um, method of uh, of addition subtraction augmentation diminution of rhythms um, and just you know, I'm a big fan of, frankly, all of his music, um, and studying it really makes me happy, and it all kind kind of stemmed from from that treatise, as well as synesthesia. <laughs> I think I think they call it an urological disorder or something bizarre like that. Um, it's it's a it is a neurological um, case. Let's say I'm not sure if it's a disorder whereby the individual perceives a link between two or more senses, i.e. sight, sound, uh, taste, touch, and um, smell. So basically, fundamentally, the, the idea would be, for example, if you have um, color grapheme synesthesia, that means that you associate certain letters of the alphabet or certain numbers with certain colors. So you would say, for instance, zero is gray, one is green, um, two is red, for instance. I'm, I don't have that kind of synesthesia. I don't, I don't perceive things like that. For me, synesthesia or, or, or my experience of, of color um, and sound and sensation, those three are linked. Where if I hear a piece of music and the first time I became aware of it, knowing that it was something different i always experienced it but I, I kind of you know i kind of realized okay you know, this is quite an extreme reaction I, i'm not sure if this is normal was actually um listening to and then subsequently performing um one of messian's preludes um the very first one actually um la colombe i think it is from his first set of preludes i think 1929 it was um, but messian himself was a synesthete he um perceived a link between color and sound. Now, this is it's very contentious because some people say it exists, some people say it doesn't exist. Um, Messian kind of put, puts it in a, in a nice way. Um, he says, I don't literally see, or don't literally hear a color when I, when, I, when I play a sound or hear a sound. It's just this very strong association. So you'd, it's not hallucinatory. You know, you don't hear a sound and hallucinate the color red or something. It's just if you were to close your eyes and hear something, or if you were to imagine it, then there would be a strong pull towards a certain shade of colors at the very least. Um, for me, that's how I experience it. Um, and it actually works the other way around. When I see certain colors, certain works of art, or certain certain visually stimulating um, pieces, then I, I can associate certain sounds with that. Um, but that's less profound as my, my perception of sound plus 
plus sensation or um, auditory tactile synesthesia, which is where certain sounds make me feel a certain way physically on my body. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that's just how, how, that's just something that is conducted how I have um, gone about some of my compositions because I find certain things are quite obvious to me when when I want to create a sound um, or I want to when I want to create a sound to a color or vice versa or whatever certain things just come very naturally and I think that's perhaps a better way of putting it moving on uh, past Messia I started looking at later 20th century composers such as Kaya Sariaho, the Finnish composer Unsuk Chin the Korean composer George Ligeti, um, Yanis Senakis Varez, and Karlheinz Stockhausen, etc., all quite well known um, late 20th century composers. Kaya and Unsuk are still alive, thank goodness. Um, something else that really interested me and that continues to interest me is spectralism, um, which plays a lot with the harmonic spectrum and sound as a musical object, so to speak. And something that they do, all of these composers that I've listed here, um, have all included electronics in their work. And I thought, well, you know, I'm studying at university. Um, I'm composing predominantly acoustic works because that's what my degree is centered around. These composers are including electronics. I think it's about time that I, I did. And so I thought, OK, let's do this. How do I do it? Well, code, <laughs> I thought. Um, or code sort of came to me. I didn't really think about it. It, it, it kind of came to me. Um, program kind of hit me in the face. Uh, it was last year, uh, early early 2020, um, in music technology with Theo Herbst, my co-supervisor um, and mentor and uh, organizer of Bode Electrons. Um, music Tech 3 with, with Theo, um, we did an introduction to Super Collider um, and scholars who had done quite a bit of work in it uh, include Bruno Ruggiero who um, wrote a gentle introduction to Super Collider as well as the YouTuber Eli Fieldsteel who has been very very helpful to me in learning Super Collider and we also um, briefly looked at C sound. Also something that I kind of hadn't really thought about was I had done it before really creative programming I'd worked in Pure Data in second year, I believe it was, with Miles Warrington, um, who was doing his PhD at UCT at the time. He took us, I think it was for a semester, where we worked in Pure Data. And at the time, I didn't really know quite that what I was doing would actually end up <laughs> interesting me further down the line. Um, but hey, look where we are now. So I thought... Um, I thought, right, we're doing Super Collider. Uh, we are working in a creative coding environment, but I can't code, not yet. <laughs> so I thought, okay, um, I can't code. You don't really need to be a, a programming buffin to work in Super Collider, I realized afterwards. But I kind of, um, I got a bit frantic about it. I thought, well, you know, I, I need to, I need to know everything about this before I do it. You know, that's how I go about things, and that's a very naive way to go about things. But my first thought was, let me go learn a programming language. My second thought was, let me learn Java. <laughs> if you know any programmers, they will ask the question, what are you doing? Java is your first programming language. Not, not always recommended, um, but I did it. So I learned Java just to kind of, in my mind, get up to scratch as a programmer or I could, you know, I could, at that time, uh, even now, I can't really consider myself a proper programmer. Um, I just needed to learn how to think like a programmer, um, how to learn um, syntax, data structures, and stuff that were common to programming languages that I can leverage in a way to to make music in Super Collider, which is very different to other programming languages, but which at the time I thought was would, would be the same. So I learned um, Java in a few months. I also then learned Dart, um, which is used in, in app development. Uh, I also learned Swift, which is used in iOS development. Flutter is a hybrid, um, is used for hybrid app development. And so I kind of thought to myself, if I ever have a change in career, I'm going to be an app developer, you know, because I learned Java for Android development. I learned Dart. Um, I learned Swift for iOS development. Um, you know, if I ever need to make money, 
<laughs> I have the skills or so I so I thought um again you 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 you, you can't just coding isn't something you just learn in a few months um I, you can but you won't be very good at it until longer down the line it's a continuous learning process I've learned and I've only been doing it for about less than two years now but I, I'm always learning more and learning how to think like a programmer and how, learning how to apply that into my music making and so I thought okay cool um I know Java now um I am going to continue with Super Collider I want to make music with Super Collider there are other options such as Max MSP Pure Data these are all kind of um, node-based, object-oriented, visual um, programming environments where you would kind of, with Max, you would have objects and you'd connect them by patch cables and, and so on. Um, I said, no, 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 I want absolute, I want low-level control. I want to, I want to tell everything what to do. Um, I don't want there to be anything in the background, which is obviously ridiculous. There's always going to be something in the background unless you're working in assembly. Um, and I thought, no, okay, um, I want to have as low level control as possible. And I'm not sure if I have struck that yet, um, but I, I, I use um, Super Collider um, and I try to hack it sometimes. Um, but I, I, I enjoy having low level control of, of things. Um, as a composer, I like being able to tell every instrument what to do, how to do it, um, and so on. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be making music with code, it's going to be on my terms and my terms only, which is a very megalomaniac thing to say, but I'm very self-conscious when it comes to my composition. I like to know everything that I'm doing and make it be, make all of it be on purpose. Otherwise, it doesn't make me happy. Besides Super Collider, I am um, in music technology. We, we started looking at um, working with oscillators um, envelopes, noise generators, um, learning techniques of modulation, amplitude, ring modulation, um, frequency modulation, um, getting into kind of glitch type sounds, working with randomness, which I am absolutely fascinated by, or I just love randomness, controlled randomness, <laughs> very controlled ran randomness with parameters, but I like, I like computers to do their own thing. Um, within boundaries. I'd like to say, right, I'm giving you two parameters, do something between those two parameters, which is very easy in Super Collider and which always returns interesting results. During this time as well, I began to look towards the visual arts. I became fascinated with Vasily Kandinsky, um, who was an abstract, abstract impressionist. He was Russian, but I think he spent quite a bit of time in, in Paris um, and elsewhere. Um, his, I'm sure you'd know one of his paintings if you were to see it. You can tell when you see a Kandinsky. And that really spoke to me. He happened to be a friend of, of Schoenberg, who is another big influence of mine. And he also happened to be a synesthete. And uh, extending my, my look into abstract expressionism, I then looked towards abstract film. Abstract film slash visual music. Um, and the Bauhaus school um, examples of abstract filmmakers are Viking Egeling, Norman McLaren, Oscar Fischinger, and John Whitney Sr., all very influential um, artists. And this, by extension, um, I thought, what, how am I going to make visual music with code? <laughs> Everything I, I tried to bring back, bring back to code, and I discovered processing, which is a coding environment, creative coding environment that's based on Java. Coincidence, I think not. Based in Java where you can make visuals. Digital art, um, generative art, that's another word that, that stuck out for me as well. Uh, generative, which again speaks to an element of randomness where kind of self-reflective art where the computer generates, you know, it speaks back to itself. It's like a feedback loop and the end result can be quite nice or it can explode. <laughs> I like the idea of generative art, generative music as well. Brian Eno coined, I'm not sure if he coined the term, but he's very well known for that. And then I thought, right, I thought oh, I, I can make music with code. Why can't I make visual music with code? So here's just uh, an, uh, an example of some processing code. So anyone who knows Java would be able to recognize this. It's quite straightforward. Um, you know, there's no public static void main. Um, you know, there's no system out print line it's 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 very straightforward 
you've got your setup function or method, well, it's a top level function. Um, and you've got your draw function. Your setup function defines the size of your canvas, uh, which is this thing on the left here. So this black square, it's 900 by 900 pixels. And then your draw function is where your actual code goes to, to, to make the visual. So you'd say your background um, is zero. So color zero, which is black. Um, rect mode center, so basically what's where's everything being aligned to. Stroke, which is the color of these white lines, your outlines. Um, this is hex code for white, basically full full uh, red, white, red, green, and blue. Stroke weight would be the thickness of the lines. Um, no fill means that your object will have nothing. And then you've got a sine wave which is a float, that's the type. You create a rectangle, which is, you'll see now it's, it animates itself, but you've, you've basically creating a rectangle and so on. You then push it to, to the matrix and you, you move it and you do all kinds of stuff. Here's a triangle, here's an ellipse, which is the circle and put it all together and hit run and you get that. So, this is very basic, very simple, um, but this is an example of something that you can do in, in processing. It's, it seemed cool at the time. Uh, it's still pretty cool. Um, in fact, I have done a few artworks on my, on my Instagram, if you can call them artworks, where um, I've only worked with circle squares and triangles uh, as a kind of etude in processing, so to speak. Coding or creative programming can be used not only as a way of making a complete work of art that you can sit down and watch or uh, look at or listen to that's already been done, the composition process is done. Coding can also be used um, as a performance means where you have, again, this fusion of music and art with code, except you're now doing it live with an audience a lot of the time. Um, so you're coding, um, composing, drawing, programming on the fly, making music, making art as a artist, musician, as a programmer, all together making a putting together a performance or an exhibition that's called live coding literally coding live um so there are some uh, pop popular live coding environments that are used uh, predominantly by musicians um there's one called tidal cycles which was developed by alex mclean um there's one called sonic pi which is developed by um, sam aaron and there's a visual um visual language called hydra which is based on javascript um, which actually runs in the browser, um, which um, was developed by Olivia Jack. It's a whole lot of live coding environments, um, basically languages where you can make pictures or videos and music with code. You're looking at your computer and typing, and there's, there's something cool about that, um, I think. So much so, I'm not the only one, so much so that um, something popped up in the 90s and is still very much a thing now called algo raves, sort of a dance dance music in a nightclub, a sweaty nightclub at two in the morning where everyone's on drugs. Um, <laughs> so your, your, your algo rave is basically a, like being a DJ or being a, a musician in a dingy nightclub at two in the morning where everyone's on drugs, um, making music with code, making uh, visuals with code. And someone who was a big pioneer of that was, was Alex McLean who created Title Cycles. And in live code, your composer slash artist is a programmer meaning that any composer or any artist can make art being a programmer and any programmer. So anyone who studied computer science or who knows a bit of JavaScript can do Hydra or who knows a bit of Ruby or a bit of Haskell, you know, it's, 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 you basically just learn the syntax um, and little idiosyncratic things. And as a programmer who has no musical training or has no visual art training, um, you just learn some code and with a with a an open mind and some creativity look at you you're an artist you're a composer which i think is great um it sort of unifies these two poles um between creativity and kind of technicality and fuses them into one um where you know your artists become nerds and your nerds become artists so to speak <laughs> um and live coding was or is still being um sort of supported by TopLab. They were founded in 2004 to explore and promote live coding. 
Um, and here's just an example of what Sonic Pi, this is Sonic Pi, what the code looks like. Um, it's based on Ruby. If, for example, if you're a live code and you're a musician and you don't have a visualist, you don't have someone doing the visuals, um, you can always throw up meters, um, which are these things you see here at the top um, where when the music's playing, they dance around like that. So the people have something to look at besides your screen because everyone's obviously dancing. Um, so yeah, that's just a little, little animation. Um, but it's usually, in fact, 99.9% .9 of the time, there's more than just code. There's usually um, visuals as well, if if nothing more than just the meters dancing around. Um, but there's always something to look at. Then moving on to more recently, applying live coding. So I got the opportunity to perform as a live coder. Um, at the moment, I'm uh, doing an exchange with the HF Gear in Karlsruhe in Germany. Um, we have weekly seminars um, uh, with, there's a whole bunch of us, about eight or nine of us. We've had two concerts this year so far. Basically, it's a network performance, network um, jamming, which is real-time performance slash improvisation um, of us eight or nine performers slash composers from across the world. Um, myself, I've been in Johannesburg um, for both concerts. Um, Theo has been in Cape Town. Um, Tamara has been in Cape Town. Uh, our companions in Germany have obviously been in Germany. Um, we've had some people in Shanghai, I think, and all, all performing in real time together from across the world. Um, not necessarily using code. I, I did. I used Super Collider um, because it's what I was most comfortable with. Um, I still am. Um, as a musician, you know, I'm not an electronic musician. Um, I am a composer, <laughs> a music composer, not very good at performing or improvising, but I try my best. And so I, I, I am performing Super Collider. And so the way I code, the way I've integrated creative programming into my um, composition process um, is I've got the acoustic component as normal. I haven't abandoned acoustic composition. That's all I know, frankly, at this point. I'm still a novice when it comes to electronic music, electroacoustic music. I've been composing predominantly acoustic music. It's only really this year that I've really um, released, at least, or shown other people some of my electro electronic and electroacoustic music. Basically, I have my acoustic component, which I compose as I usually would. And while, while I'd be doing that, I'd have an idea of what, what electronic elements I'd like to integrate into the piece itself. So thinking electroacoustically from the, from the get-go. Then what I would do, um, either afterwards or during, um, is I would take my buffers, which are sort of pre-recorded samples, um, and my synths, and I would treat them as, as instruments themselves and sort of work with them in Super Collider. Um, for one of my pieces, um, Morpheus Somnium, I am going to show an example from the score. We had a performance and recording of it, um, where there were buffers and synths played back as instruments. And then there was also a live um, electronic component where the sound of the instrument, which was the bass clarinet in this case, was processed in real time in Super Collider, i.e. by code. So, you know, Super Collider working as a composition tool, as a live coding tool, and essentially as, as an effects system, being, being able to work in, in conjunction with a pre-composed piece in, in performance and recording. And then what I would do is then blend blend the uh, uh, acoustic um, components with the electronic components in the Super Collider. And I, I'll just show you how I go about doing this because I'm a very visual person. So when I, um, I didn't know where to start, frankly, when I set out in this piece, but a good place to start is a score. Uh, but before we get there, this is an example of what a synth theft would look like in Super Collider. So uh, if you want to make a noise, uh, if you want to make a sine wave, a sound of a sine wave, you need what's called a synth def. And you give it a name, so sine, very creative. Then you give it a function, and in the function you'll give some parameters, you'll um, or some arguments. Um, then you would have an envelope to determine how the synth starts and ends. Here's your actual synth. Um, this is actually four synths. Um, and here, here's my, my proclivity for randomness. Um, our frequency, we start with a hundred, but we never actually use a hundred. We use 
the frequency, so 100 multiplied by any integer um, or any float between 1 and 1.02. Now that sounds minuscule, but it does make a difference. And we do that four times. So you've got four synths playing, um, well, four sine waves, each at something between 100 and 102 hertz. Um, so I lie. You know, there's a case where, you know, all four of these could at any given time be 100. It's possible. Um, but they, they, they do change every time you you reevaluate, you'd reevaluate the synth. And then um, this here is, uh, this is your, your uh, amplitude. So you'd be multiplying all of this by a given amplitude to um, tell us what, what, uh, how loud it's going to be. Yes, sorry, this is, this um, generates a random uh, flow to between zero and 1.0. This is the amplitude. So each one of these is going to be at a different level. And then we scale that down. And then you apply the envelope and the amplitude, and then you splay it, um, in other words, um, distribute it across um, across whatever space you have at the point. This happened to be a quadraphonic setup, so each one of these synths would be panned somewhere um, between the four points in a quadraphonic setup. And then um, you send it out to your output. And then you'd instantiate this, this synth um, later on. Um, so this is basically just a blueprint of what the synth would look like. And this is pretty much where you, where you start. And you're obviously not limited to sine waves. There's a whole bunch of unit generators or UGENs that are at your disposal, literally hundreds. Um, so the, the possibilities are endless and people are still developing for Super Collider. So here's just an example of what my piece Morpheus Omnium looks like. Um, it's for bass clarinets and two laptops. So my score, the way I looked at it, and other composers have done it as well, I think, is um, you've got the bass clarinet part. So this is the bass clarinet doing his thing. Um, or her thing, in this case, the performer was a male. And here's space. So this would actually be the reverb and the delay um, and the ring modulation. So this here... This would be uh, controlled by laptop one, I think it was, um, and he or she would then um, trigger space zero, which was where the piece began, and this would have default um, parameters for the reverb delay and ring modulation, and then over here you would decrease the ring modulation, um, and that would be your space. So this would be um, the reverb delay and ring modulation applied to the bass clarinet, which would be mic which would be mic'd up. Um, again, in real time, so your laptop performer will be using code to process the bass clarinet in real time. And then we've got our synth at the bottom here, which is basically where the synths in Super Collider would go. And the first one happens to be uh, uh, B flat, a, a chord on, on B flat. Um, later on in the piece, it's very rare that I actually use uh, um, synths that are tuned to pitches. And over here, I've given you what, what it should sound like, strings. It's actually not a string sample um, from a keyboard, for example. It's my generation of, of synths that I perceive to be strings. And then the tape component at the bottom, which would be your conventional tapes or your fixed media. And here, just another example. Here's the bass clarinet part, some flutter tonguing, um, some slap tongue, some key clicks. And here we would have some delay on the space um, component here. So this would be an echo delay. Uh, and this would then be triggered by space two. So when space two is evaluated, then um, this, this bit by the bass clarinet would then be echoed. Um, and here's reverb thickening as well. So building up to this delay, um, the laptop performer would then increase the reverb. And here's our synth as well. I think this is still the strings over here. The um, second performer would uh, hit stop in, in Super Collider or actually created a touch OC interface for it to make it life easier um, if you're not a programmer. Um, so here he or she would hit stop and over the course of, I think it's one second, two quavers. And I think the quaver was, I think the quaver was 60. So this would be over two seconds. The um, the synth would then fade out, and at the same time, 
this tape component would have um, a tambourine. This the sound would be a tambourine, and it would have on it pitch shifting, which would also then be controlled um, using well by the by the operator. Um, so your tambourine would then be pitch shifted down arbitrarily. Those aren't fixed pitches. Um, uh, and here's just another example of kind of a delay line um, and random movement. Again, here's my my love of randomness. Um, yeah. Um, so just finally, um, you know, my my experimenting in creative coding with with audio. Um, obviously expanded to visual stuff, to audiovisual stuff, and it is possible to make your creative coding environments speak to each other, to create audio reactive visuals, in other words, visual music, or um, visuals that react to the music. Um, and you can do that entirely in code. Um, you can do it between, for example, title cycles, uh, which is uh, written in Haskell, um, you can make title cycles talk to super collider oh sorry talk to processing title cycles piggybacks off super collider sound engine and you can make title cycles talk to processing and make what you do in title cycles generate something in processing so generate um visuals in processing by whatever it is that you've written in title cycles uh, and this could kind of um, make you let you perform a sort of solo algorithm and yeah, your existing audio um, in in title cycles or elsewhere um, can then be accessed by processing to create a visual sketch. So if you want to create a still or a a a video of in processing from something that already exists, so it's not necessarily live, you can also do that. So you can very much make audiovisual art um, with code. And here's just an example. Um, um, and this is an example of a um, visualization where um, this artist has taken um, the sound of two black holes colliding, uh, which is um, a sound clip available at MIT's, I think it's in the public domain, but he, she, he or she has taken the sound, um, written some processing code and visualized it. So this is what the sound of two black hole, holes colliding looks like. The sound looks like, not the actual thing. Yeah, and so on. I recommend um, looking checking that out, creative programming. This is one of the visual possibilities um, of, of creative coding with music, using existing music, and I think it's absolutely fascinating, and I can't wait to keep using it in my music and in my art going forward. Thank you very much. Um, it's been fun. I hope you enjoyed me talking nonsense. Um, and yeah, this was just a, a breakdown or a little trip through where I've come as a composer, where I am now and where I'm hoping to go um, and how I've used uh, creative programming to, to get there, to be here and to keep going. Um, and that's, that's how it is. I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival and hopefully see you soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for, um, uh, I thought I knew what you were up to, but clearly, um, evidently, I'm not, you know, so this yeah. was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay, you can see the chat line or the chat room. Uh, yes. Shall we, shall we uh, delve a little bit into Miles's question, a particular pathway you'd recommend from a reading resource point of view for students to be taught and learn super collider? Yes, um, personally, I've YouTube um, <laughs> and reading the docs. Um, you know, there's, I don't know where I saw something, but it, a, a common programming phrase is read the effing docs, <laughs> you know. Um, but me personally, the, the biggest help has been um, the Super Collider tutorials on YouTube by um, Eli Fieldsteel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. He's a lecturer at somewhere in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, I'm not sure where. Um, mm. 
Illinois. It might be the University of Illinois. I'm 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 not sure, but he's a super collider boffin. Um, yeah. I've learned so much from him, from his composition program um, techniques and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's given some classes during COVID that are available online, um, for free. So, yeah. Um, Miles, please feel free to follow up. Um, I would please like to make a little bit of a, not a detour, but just step back a little bit, um, Matthew, back to your band days. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so you arrived at UCT and um, sat me down and said, listen, this is how you mix pop, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my apologies. Those, I was a bit of a cocky bastard. Those are the only <laughs> students that get anywhere are those who sit down as old folk and tell them, you know, actually. Um, so those mixes are still reference. Seriously, now, those mixes are still reference mixes to me. Um, oh, so they, you. Yeah, they are. They, they've been stored. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm very interested in what I perceive as a breakdown between um, pop mix strategies and skills mm -hmm. um, and contemporary or more experimental electroacoustic music. For me, uh, um, there's a disconnect there. Um, on the one hand, it, it appears for me completely or totally logical to say that, mm. well, we're dealing with electroacoustic media. So yeah. <clears throat> surely, surely timbral considerations and, and uh, mixing strategies that apply within one domain, broadly speaking, within the popular domain, surely these should be translatable to electroacoustic music that perhaps is, is more experimental. Um, do you agree with that statement, that synopsis of, of mine? Or, and if you do not agree with it, um, how, how, do you, how do you step from the pop to the more um, experimental electroacoustic worlds? Well, I mean, it's a bit of a, it's, it, I mean, you th I think you have a point uh, with regards to sort of being able to mix pop music and working. I mean, essentially, the only connection that I can see there is the fact that you're working in Pro Tools. Um, uh -huh. mm -hmm. For me, um, Pro Tools is my DAW of choice. Uh, pop and contemporary le electroacoustic music are two completely different worlds. Mm -hmm. um, how I would apply what I learned there to what I do is basically what I learned about um, equalization, reverb, delay, um, the fundamentals about that. So the aesthetics are quite different. Yes. Uh, and if I have a look at my my piece, Vastitas, um, mm. for, which is coming up at the concert this evening, it's an audiovisual right. piece. If I show you my Pro Tools session from that, and I would do it now, but I can't. Um, if I show you my Pro Tools session from that versus a Pro Tools session from six years ago or whenever right. when I was mixing pop, chalk and cheese um uh -huh. absolute chalk and cheese if you look at the plugins i've used um on on one of my pop mixes or one of the other mixes it's it's a mess <laughs> okay. um it's 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 there's a lot there's a lot of it working upwards of 80 channels with too many buses too many reverbs 10 eqs e, um stuff like that. And mm -hmm. it's not to say that those things are bad. It's just that I, I felt at the time that I needed all of that to make it sound like proper pop music. Right. With with electroacoustic, what I've, my limited work in, uh, in electroacoustic music has been more focused on the individual sound, but uh -huh. at a more basic level, as opposed to trying to fix everything with EQ and compression, um, how to fix things, you know, before they get into Pro Tools or when they're in Pro Tools using other techniques. Um, so I use very few plugins um, uh -huh, uh -huh. in Pro Tools, pretty much, yeah, EQ delay, sometimes okay. reverb, um, but much less, much fewer than I, see. than I used to use. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, that, that certainly, <clears throat> that, that is a, a mind shift, I think, on, on your part, if I, if I look in from the outside. Yes. Um, if you, if you wouldn't mind me then posing one more uh, question about our improvisation activities with with yes. Karlsruhe. Um, I, it's interesting that both of us um, are 
are involved. Uh, we've done a couple of concerts, yeah. next one coming up in Feb. But you yeah. and I have actually never spoken um, in great uh, uh, depth or discussed in great depth how, how, how you see this improvisation versus um, composed music. Um, what, what are your views there? Um, I'm torn. Um, I can't improvise. I'll be honest, uh, even with this improvisation workshop, I've spent hours um, in Super Collider tailoring synth depths, tailoring uh -huh. buffers, fixing okay. everything so that when we're improvising, I'm just hitting play. Okay. Um, I'm hitting play or I'm making slight adjustments. Um, sure. And as a composer, that's what I, that's how I work. Um, right. You know, if I were limited for time, I would be stuffed. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I'm so I'm very I'm very wary to to improvise and I'm very careful about what it is that I use in my improvisation strategies and mm. stuff like that. But at the same time, there's something exciting about it. Um, I'm not sure which which way is more. I think I'm swaying more, more towards composition than improv. But I suppose it takes me a bit back to my performing days um, where you would kind of get on stage and there's something about the live component that right. I wouldn't say it appeals to me anymore. I think that's one of the reasons why I stopped performing. Um, but okay. I think improving with a lot of other people um, where you can kind of hide and where everything <laughs> is, where everything yeah. is yeah. sorted out before the fact. Mm. Um, right. Yeah. And then you contribute to the, to the Yeah. And it's about that contribution, judging when, when to add and when not mm. to, but yeah. 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 Well, Matthew, um, thank you. I look forward very much to the uh, performance later today. And thank you. Um, um, I, I wish you all all strength. And um, thank you. I, I, I do hope that we can invite you back next year with a, with a live uh, composition performance uh, at Bird <laughs> Electrons. Yes. Thanks yeah. a lot. Cool. Bye. Bye. Bye.